things you didn't know about the Korean War. You ever heard of the Korean War? It's like this forgotten chapter in the history books, but let me tell you, it's one hell of a story. From 1950 to 53, things got real hot as both sides of the Iron Curtain duped it out over control of the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, it doesn't get as much spotlight as World War II or Vietnam, but trust me, it is packed with some seriously overlooked facts that are gonna blow your mind. The first jet versus jet dogfight. The Second World War saw many technological advancements, including significant improvements in aircraft technology. Of these, perhaps the most important was the creation of jet aircraft, which vastly outperformed more traditional propeller-driven aircraft. The first jet to enter combat was the German ME-262, which prompted the Allies to prioritize their own jet fighters. By the time of the Korean War, air forces on both sides of the conflict made use of jet aircraft. The North Koreans and their Chinese allies used the Soviet-made MiG-15, while the UN forces included the F-80 Shooting Star, the first jet fighter in use in combat by the American military, as well as the P-9F Panther, and later the F-86 Sabre. It was inevitable that these would clash in the skies over Korea. There is some controversy as to the first jet versus jet conflict. Many insist that the first incident occurred on November 8, 1950, when U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Russell A. Brown, piloting an F-80C Shooting Star, shot down a MiG-15, flown by Senior Lieutenant Karatonov, a Soviet pilot who was working with the North Koreans. Recent evidence, however, has shown that the Soviet pilot managed to return to his airbase safely. Apparently, Karatonov jettisoned his external fuel tanks, and in the confusion of the battle, Brown mistook these for parts of the aircraft falling away after being hit by a burst from the Shooting Star's 50 caliber machine guns. In spite of this controversy, Brown's feet still stands by the U.S. Air Force as the first jet versus jet kill. The very next day, U.S. Navy pilot Lieutenant Commander William T. Amon, flying an F-9F 2B Panther, engaged another MiG-15, flown by Captain Mikhail Grachev. He and other members of the squadron were flying escort for a bombing run against the bridge on the Chinese-North Korean border when they first encountered the MiGs. After a brief pursuit, Amon downed the MiG with a burst from the Panther's 20mm cannons. After the end of the Cold War, it was revealed that Grachev was indeed shot down in this fashion, confirming Amon's victory. With this revelation, it can be assumed that Amon and the U.S. Navy holds the distinction as the first jet to shoot down another jet. Regardless of who scored the first kill, the Korean War was a host to a large number of air battles, including protracted fights over what became known as MiG Alley in northwestern North Korea, where MiGs and most often American F-86 Sabres battled for supremacy over the skies. Seoul was captured four times. In war, capturing the enemy's capital city is of great strategic importance, and often entire battle plans revolve around scoring such an objective. Likewise, defending one's capital is of tremendous importance, and losing it to the enemy is a major blow to morale. Seoul, the capital as well as the most populated city in South Korea, serves as the industrial, political, and cultural center of the nation. It is also very unfortunately placed, located a mere 35 miles from the 38th parallel, which divides the peninsula. Because of this, it's extremely vulnerable to capture from the north. This is exactly what happened. On June 25, 1950, North Korean forces launched their assault against their southern neighbors, who were caught completely off guard. Three days later, Seoul fell to the rapid advance. South Korean and later UN troops were pushed back under the seemingly inexorable advance of the North Koreans, holding out around the Pusan perimeter in southeastern Korea. In September, UN forces launched an audacious amphibious landing at Incheon, a port on the western coast of the peninsula near Seoul, now well behind North Korean lines. Caught off guard, the North Koreans were unable to defend against this onslaught, and elements of the 1st Marine Division, as well as South Korean contingents, recaptured Seoul on September 26th. At the same time, forces in the Pusan perimeter attempted a successful breakout, shattering North Korean forces and driving them from South Korean territory. The commander of UN forces, American General Douglas MacArthur, continued to advance into North Korea. Eventually, this prompted the Chinese to become involved in the conflict directly, sending 260,000 troops, which drove the UN forces back south again. 
On January 4, 1951, Seoul once again fell to the enemy as Chinese troops marched into the city. It stayed in their hands until a counteroffensive dislodged them, liberating the city a second time on March 14, 1951. The city would not fall again, though it would be threatened for the remainder of the conflict. During the course of the fighting, the city was severely depopulated and left in ruins. One of the most dangerous enemies was the weather. During the course of the fighting, the forces involved had to contend with some of the most advanced weaponry available during the era. Modern firearms, artillery, and air power took a savage toll on those who fought. There was another danger, one that came not from the enemy, but from the environment itself. Korea generally enjoys a temperate climate, but during the winter, cold fronts from Siberia descend on the peninsula, freezing everything in its path. Temperatures can plummet, reaching as low as 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. In one of the most famous battles of the war, from November 27th to December 13th, the 1st Marine Division, supported by the U.S. Army's 3rd Infantry Division, as well as South Korean and British forces, clashed with North Korean and Chinese troops at the Chosin Reservoir in northeastern North Korea. The U.N. forces fought off repeated waves of North Korean and Chinese troops, who vastly outnumbered them. In addition to these odds, a cold front caused the mercury to plunge to negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit. In these conditions, any exposed skin would almost invariably suffer some damage from the frigid air. Medics would be forced to carry morphine surrettes in their mouths to keep them from freezing. Blood plasma would be rendered useless as it would freeze into solid chunks of ice. Batteries used to power radios and operate jeeps and other vehicles would fail to operate in the cold. In the aftermath of the battle, the casualties were tallied. The Americans and Allies suffered around 2,500 killed during the fighting with about 5,000 wounded. During the same course of time, they also experienced between 7 to 8,000 injuries due to frostbite or other cold-related issues. It's likely that virtually all of the troops endured some form of cold-related injury, such as frostbite or hypothermia. In response, the U.S. military devised new protocols for treating those exposed to the cold, mostly to avoid gangrene, a common problem for wounds exposed to the frigid air. One of the factors for the numerous cold-related casualties was the lack of proper winter gear, such as adequate gloves and boots. During the Second World War, many cases of supposed cold injuries, such as those sustained during the Battle of the Bulge, were revealed to not be frostbite, but trench foot or other ailments. And as a result, the military didn't update its cold weather gear. The Quartermaster Corps of the U.S. military went to work creating new winter uniforms, featuring multiple layers of clothing, thicker gloves, and oversized footwear, nicknamed Mickey Mouse boots, due to their distinct size and shape. For those who suffered due to the extreme weather, the effects continued long after they thawed out. For decades, veterans of Chosin and other frigid battlefields experienced delayed symptoms, such as malformed toenails, skin on their feet having difficulty healing, increased rates of skin cancer, as well as tingling and numbness any time the temperature drops, an unfortunate legacy after battling an enemy just as deadly as any shell or bullet. Ooh, you'd think that after facing the wrath of Mother Nature in past wars, the military powers that be would have, like, figured out a thing or two, right? I mean, with all the lessons from, like, Napoleon's Russian fiasco and the bitter winters of World War II, you'd expect them to be better prepared for the Korean freeze. I guess sometimes history's lessons take a while to sink in, and unfortunately, it's often the soldiers who pay the price. The war never ended in 1953. The Korean War officially began on June 25, 1950, when Communist North Korea launched an invasion of Western-backed South Korea. Responding to this aggression, an American-led UN task force began a protracted military intervention to throw back the invasion. After three years, the North, supported by the Chinese and to a lesser extent the Soviet Union, and the South, backed by the U.S. and Allies, agreed to an armistice, which was signed on July 27, 1953. Negotiations for the armistice lasted over two years and consisted of 158 separate meetings between the representatives of both sides. Eighteen separate copies of the agreement were signed, written in three languages, Korean, Chinese, and English. For all practical purposes, this marked the end of hostilities, though it did not end the war. 
The actual agreement is purely military in nature, as no nation directly signed the document. The armistice confirmed the 38th parallel as the boundary between North and South Korea and the establishment of the Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ, a cleared section of land that acts as a buffer between the two nations. This armistice was created until a separate formal peace agreement could be reached. This has never occurred. From that day until the present, the Korean War is still ongoing. South Korea has the ninth largest defense budget on the planet and also maintains mandatory conscription as a defense against possible aggression from the North. North Korea maintains a large military as well, though the exact makeup of this force is difficult to determine due to the secretive nature of the nation. Over the intervening decades, there have been dozens of border incidents where both sides clashed in limited engagements, though this has never broken out into open war. There have been multiple attempts to turn the armistice into an actual peace treaty between the two nations, the most recent being the Panmunjom Declaration in 2018, though negotiations stalled and the agreement has never been finalized. As of today, the conflict is still technically ongoing, with both sides warily eyeing each other until peace can finally come to the Korean Peninsula. Alright, so check this out. After the Korean War wrapped up, North and the South went down way different paths. Up North, you got Kim Il-sung setting up shop with the whole dictator thing. While down South, it's all about building up from nothing. Like, seriously, South Korea went from a war-torn, devastated country to an economic powerhouse, earning itself the nickname Miracle on the Han River. Instead of a tale of two cities, it's a tale of two Koreas. The war was an international effort. When North Korea invaded their southern neighbor, the recently established United Nations condemned the invasion and sent a large force to hold back the North Korean tide. While it is popularly believed that this was a primarily American intervention, there's more to the story than that. The UN Security Council passed Resolutions 83 and 84, condemning the North's aggression. At this point, the Soviet Union was boycotting the UN, and the Soviet ambassador was unavailable at the time. Unable to exercise their veto, the resolutions passed and military force was authorized. Backing the North Korean cause were sizable elements of the Chinese military, as well as material support from their communist allies, the Soviet Union, who may have also secretly sent pilots and military advisors to the conflict as well. Countering this was the South Korean military, which was supported by a UN force which consisted mostly of American troops, though there were contributions from 15 other nations who engaged in combat actions directly, including Great Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, Ethiopia, Greece, Belgium, Turkey, and many others, with the smallest contribution coming from the tiny nation of Luxembourg, who sent a contingent of 85 men to the fighting. Other nations who provided aid, such as medical or material support for the UN effort, include Italy, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Japan, Pakistan, India, Uruguay, El Salvador, Spain, Taiwan, Israel, and West Germany. During the course of the war, both sides suffered heavily, with the North and the South suffering about half a million casualties each. China also suffered heavily, with an estimated 110,000 killed and 380,000 wounded during the fighting. The United States military lost over 36,000 men, with an additional 92,000 wounded. The rest of the UN force also endured significant casualties, numbering in the thousands, though their contributions and sacrifices are often overlooked in an already forgotten conflict. The war is not technically a war. When the United Nations decided to commit forces to repel the North Korean advance into the South, it was for all practical purposes a war like any other. Thousands of men fought and died along the established front lines. There were offensives, counter-offensives, retreats, maneuvers, and all the other trappings of a war. By any reasonable metric, it was a war. It was, however, technically not a war. The conflict was officially described as a police action. While the bulk of the United Nations forces were American and were led by American generals, it was not, technically speaking at least, an American military operation. All of the effort was under the auspices and authority of the United Nations, not the United States. As a result, the countries involved did not actually go to war of their own accord, but did so under the UN banner. 
This is an important distinction, as the actions in Korea represent the first attempt of the new organization to ensure global security, the first of many over the intervening decades. The United Nations needed to act decisively in order to establish itself as an authoritative body, and not as ineffectual as its predecessor, the League of Nations. U.S. President Harry Truman didn't ask for a formal declaration of war from Congress, and Congress never granted one. Therefore, technically, the United States as a nation never went to war with Korea. This may seem, at best, like a bureaucratic or legalistic quibble, which it was, but officially the Korean War was not a war, just a police action. For those caught up in the fighting, however, this distinction is arbitrary and ultimately meaningless. Yeah, a bit of a head-scratcher on that one. The Korean War wasn't technically a war, but it's not the only time. Like, there was also the Malayan Emergency and the Vietnam quote-unquote war. Yeah, these were also classified as police actions. An American clerk started the war. In the aftermath of World War II, tensions between the United States and Soviet Union were high. Both sides looked for any advantage over the other. In 1949, the Soviets got a major break. A clerk working at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow defected, giving the Soviets some access to American communication codes. These were useful, but what was more significant was the information about his fellow clerks. One of these, known only as Jack, had fallen in love with a Russian woman known only as Nadia. Based on descriptions given by the defector, the NKVD was able to track the pair and eventually offered a deal. In exchange for encryption information, Jack would receive $100,000 and the possibility that Nadia would be able to leave the USSR for a better life in the West. Given such an offer, Jack spent the rest of his tour at the embassy giving ciphers, explaining encoding procedures, and even providing broken pieces of cipher equipment. As a result, the Soviets were able to crack American secret communications. Soviet leader Joseph Stalin wanted to avoid direct confrontation with the U.S. and would not commit to any action that could provoke hostilities. Due to the broken code, however, it was discovered that the U.S. was transferring troops in Asia to Japan, implying that they were unwilling to become involved in the brewing conflict in the Korean Peninsula. With this information, Stalin gave the go-ahead to his ally Kim Il-sung to invade the South. As for what happened to the pair, Nadia was not allowed to leave the Soviet Union. And as for Jack, his fate and true identity remain unknown even to this day. It was the first desegregated conflict in U.S. history. From the beginning of the inception of the United States, African-American soldiers have fought with bravery and distinction. Some have gone down in history as legends in the annals of military history, such as the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, the 369th Infantry Regiment, better known as the Harlem Hellfighters, and the Tuskegee Airmen. Other ethnicities fought as well, such as the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, which was made up of Japanese Americans who fought in the Second World War. While they fought bravely in their respective conflicts, every individual served in units segregated by race. This changed in 1948, when President Harry Truman signed Executive Order 9981, which desegregated the military. The order stated that, quote, there shall be equality of treatment and opportunity for all persons in the armed services without regard for race, color, religion, or national origin, end quote. The order continues to state that this policy is to be implemented as soon as possible, and that all rules and laws governing the military were to be reviewed and updated to accommodate the new order. The newly created Air Force was the first to desegregate, followed by the Navy. The process was slower in the other branches. The Army and the Marine Corps were hesitant to allow full integration into their units, though due to the fighting and heavy losses, by the end of the conflict, soldiers of all races and ethnicities served alongside one another. This was one of the first and most significant moments in the burgeoning civil rights movement. There are many interesting facts and tales that can be told of the Korean War, all of which deserve to be remembered. Perhaps the unfortunate epitaph of the Forgotten War can finally be set aside. Um, excuse me.
There are many interesting facts and tales that can be told of the Korean War, all of which deserve to be remembered. So maybe the unfortunate uh, epitaph of the Forgotten War can finally be set aside. What facts surprised you guys the most? Eh, uh, 